All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here to join us this evening for a chat with our expert, Dr. Romig. Dr. Romig is one of our cardiologists at Wilmington Health, and he practices primarily at our 1202 Medical Center Drive location in Wilmington. Um, and this evening, he's going to talk to us about atrial fibrillation. Some of you may have heard it called AFib. Uh, but Dr. Romig is board certified in in cardiology, internal medicine, nuclear cardiology, and echocardiography. So we are so happy to have you, Dr. Romig, um, and I'm going to let you take it away. All right. Well, thank you for this opportunity to spend a little time with you guys this evening. Um, it's great to see people engaging um, in their healthcare and wanting to be actively involved in in maybe a disease process that they have personally, or maybe a friend or family member has, so they can learn a little bit more about that. Um, so thank you for this opportunity. Hopefully we'll just keep it light, something that we can all spend a little time learning a little bit more about. Um, so I guess just a little bit about myself. Uh, professionally, um, I did my medical school through Michigan State University. I was in East Lansing, Michigan for several years. Um, I did my internal medicine training and then my cardiology fellowship after that, all through Beaumont Health, which is in the Metro Detroit area. So that process was about six years or so. Um, got tired of the Michigan winters. Detroit was cold and gray and got tired of shoveling snow. So uh, my wife and I, at the time, we moved from Detroit down to Asheville, North Carolina. I spent four years. First job out of fellowship was with a cardiology group in Asheville. Um, and then a good opportunity came up to move to the beach. So jumped on that and have been with Wilmington Health now for just about two years. Uh, haven't looked back. Loved every minute of it, minute of it so far. So um this is my family, just a little bit about myself from that perspective. My wife and I, we've been married now for 15 years. Uh, we have two beautiful girls, seven and four. There's Harper and Emerson. So I have a second grader and a preschooler, which is kind of hard to believe. Never thought that would happen, but we enjoy doing all sorts of fun stuff. We're really engaged with Wilmington and learning all about that. We like to be outdoors as much as we can and just spend time together as a family. So you might see us out and about. If you do, feel free to say hi, but uh, just enjoy that time with them and spending time in Wilmington. Uh, but I guess most importantly, we're here to talk a little bit about atrial fibrillation. Um, this is something that is obviously very common. Um, if this is something that you have personally, don't feel like you're alone. It's the most common um, abnormal heart rhythm that we have here in the US. There's over 6 million people and that number is going up every day. So you are not alone. Um, as the population continues to age, we expect um, the number of folks with atrial fibrillation to only increase. So that number is gonna just continue to climb in the next couple of years, in the next couple of decades. And really it's one of those things that it's a disease, unfortunately it just becomes more common as we age. Um, we definitely see more people in their 80s with AFib compared to their 70s, compared to their 60s, but really even starting in our 40s, we have about a 25% chance of eventually um, developing it. So um, I may be there someday. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but it does seem to be more common when we have other cardiac conditions as well. So something like high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, and coronary artery disease also kind of increase the, I guess, your percent chance of developing that. It's very important that we address this because it is so common um, that we manage it as best as we can because we do know that AFib can increase um, risk of stroke and thromboembolism also can increase our risk of death because of the um, things that come along with the, with the condition itself, mainly coming from the risk of thromboembolism and strokes. Um, it does add quite a considerable cost to healthcare because with it being so common, it increases risk of hospitalizations, not just once or twice, but recurrent hospitalizations. 
there's procedures involved, whether we're trying to get somebody out of atrial fibrillation, either urgently or planned. Um, there's multiple prescription medications that are typically necessary to manage this medically. Um, and then obviously there's follow-up. So once something or someone, excuse me, is diagnosed with AFib, you know, you're typically going to be following with a cardiologist for years to come. So all that can kind of add up as somebody maybe in their 60s is diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, and then we expect, you know, another 20 years of management. So it's not something that necessarily just goes away, even despite um, medicine. So there was a study done not too long ago that looked at almost 600 people who have stroke risk factors, um, but don't necessarily have the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. We managed or monitored those people for several years to see if they ever did develop AFib. And um, over 40 months, 35% of them developed atrial fibrillation. So it's something that if you're at risk for it, you know, we, if we look for it, we're probably going to find it in a good percentage of people out there. Um, it can lead to structural changes to the heart itself. Um, it can lead to some remodeling of the chambers, um, leading to dysfunction or the fact that those chambers may not just work as efficiently as they should, and that can lead to symptoms. So if they're left unaddressed or unmanaged, those changes can occur and folks may develop, you know, shortness of breath or heart failure type symptoms. So definitely something that can cause some structural changes to the heart, but we also see that it causes for electrical remodeling um, of the heart, which again, if left unmanaged for quite a bit of time, then it can make it more and more challenging to get those individuals out of atrial fibrillation because the electrical pathways have been remodeled over time. Um, so there's some other conditions um, that can kind of predispose folks to developing atrial fibrillation. One of them is high blood pressure. It's the number one risk for recurrent atrial fibrillation, especially if that blood pressure isn't being well managed and um, can definitely lead to folks developing recurrent episodes of atrial fibrillation. Um, two thirds of people who have heart failure that are over the age of 65 also develop atrial fibrillation. So, you know, 66% of people with heart failure, which is also a pretty large number of people out there um, can develop atrial fibrillation. We do see this often in the hospital, folks that come in with um, an acute or active heart attack during their hospital stay can develop atrial fibrillation. Um, some of that has to do with the acuity of the situation and kind of the sickness of that presentation. Um, but especially depending on which heart artery is affected um, with that heart attack, um, they can have a decent percent chance of developing AFib, not only during that hospitalization, but also in the weeks and months to come. There are some non-cardiac conditions that we'll always look for when we're addressing or managing AFib, especially when initially diagnosed. So there's some things that we want to look at as far as their thyroid level. If somebody's got a very high or overactive thyroid, that can lead to them developing or predisposed to atrial fibrillation. The heart and lungs are very interconnected. So we can see that if somebody has bad lung disease, maybe bad COPD for any number of reasons that can put extra strain or stress on the heart um, and can predispose them to developing atrial fibrillation. Excessive alcohol intake, we can see this sometimes in our younger folks that come in with atrial fibrillation. I say that typically, you know, we see AFib starting to develop more often in people in their 60s and their 70s. Occasionally, you may see somebody in their 30s that maybe is a went on a binge alcohol drink, you know, time over the weekend, I don't know, and all of a sudden threw themselves into atrial fibrillation. So we can see that. Diabetes for sure, and I had mentioned um, age. So as we age, you know, the kind of the percent chance of developing atrial fibrillation uh, definitely increases. Um, you may wonder, well, why don't we just go look for this in everybody then, if it's such a big deal, if it's so common, um, well, that hasn't really panned out to make much of an impact. Um, it's not necessarily recommended that we go around just routinely screening people um, over the age of 65, just to say, let's see if you have it. Um, the usual thing is just to recommend to folks every once in a while, it hasn't been 
harmful or you know necessarily better or worse than to just check your pulse on your wrist. Uh, just simply placing your fingers over your pulse on your wrist and just making sure that you know you have that nice even you know regular beat to beat um, interval as opposed to having somebody wear a heart monitor for an extended period of time who may not necessarily have any symptoms. Um, so there's a US preventative task force that doesn't recommend it. Um, when these, these studies were done, it didn't necessarily make a big difference as far as outcome. Um, and so we don't necessarily just screen for it routinely. You may hear about that in some of these um, life screening things that maybe will come to your community center and say, let's screen for AFib and they do an EKG or something like that. You know, I can't really say that that's making a huge impact um, in healthcare as far as reducing the risk or picking it up more, but it's definitely recommended that you at least occasionally, you know, check your pulse, especially if you're feeling some type of irregularity or pounding, that's not something that's gonna hurt you by any means and may actually help. Um, so that's something to consider because some of the signs or symptoms with atrial fibrillation are very kind of variable person to person. Um, sometimes people can definitely sense an irregularity to their heart rhythm. They may have palpitations, sometimes get very short of breath or lightheaded, um, but up to a third of people have no symptoms whatsoever of atrial fibrillation. And unfortunately, it's not uncommon to see that their first or you know, initial diagnosis of atrial fibrillation is after somebody's had a stroke. So obviously we wanna to get to that ahead of time, but unfortunately we know that there are a decent percent people out there that have no symptoms of AFib. Um, a lot of it kind of depends on, you know, some of the comorbid conditions. If somebody's very young and otherwise healthy, they may not necessarily have many symptoms, but if you already have maybe an underlying lung disease or maybe um, some other condition, you might just be a little bit more in tune with it and notice a difference. Um, other symptoms could be very lightheaded, more easily fatigued. Um, rarely will we have somebody have chest pain because of it. Um, sometimes, again, fortunately very rare, but can occur where people can get very lightheaded to the point that they feel like they're gonna pass out or actually do pass out. Um, so those, again, some of the symptoms maybe to be on the lookout for, if this is something that uh, you or maybe a family member have been experiencing, always something to consider. But at the same time, we have to remember that a third of the folks out there have no symptoms, you know, whatsoever. Um, so as mentioned, just palpating the wrist, you have an irregularity to your um, pulse itself. Um, think of a piano, you know, you're going to have that metronome that's just back and forth, back and forth. That should be how our pulse is. It should be very regular beat to beat. Um, whereas with atrial fibrillation, the time between each heartbeat is going to be different. So we say that it's in a regularly irregular rhythm. There's no rhyme or reason to the synchrony to each heartbeat. Um, so that's definitely something you may just sense that every beat, there's no specific timing or cadence, I guess you could say, um, to the pulse itself. Um, Dr. This Romick, is, yeah. really quick. I um, just wanna make sure I pause for a second. Were there any questions at this moment? And if you did have any questions, feel free to unmute for a moment. And we can kind of pause here for a second. And if not, we can keep on going. All right, very good. Well, this is an example of what I would be looking at as far as an EKG. Um, if you look at those uh, squiggly black lines, they may not mean much to you, but to me, they mean quite a bit. Um, the top example is what I would look at and say, okay, this is a very normal, regular heart rhythm. Um, each wave to there makes sense to me. Uh, there's a small um, little, I guess, bump that you would say before the narrow kind of higher peak to peak. That's what we look for to say, that, all right, that's where our heart rhythm is normal. We should see that before every heartbeat. If you look down on the bottom example, the one labeled atrial fibrillation, you can see that the space between those narrow kind of peaks is different between each one. And we're missing that small little bump before um, those narrow complexes. So that's an example of what we would say is atrial fibrillation because 
each beat to beat is variable and there's no what we would call P wave. That's what we look for on the EKG, which here is an example of that. Uh, this is just the whole thing that we look at when you come into the doctor's office that says, let's get your 12 lead EKG. This is an example of it. Um, the heart rate itself for atrial fibrillation can be very variable as well. Um, sometimes people can have a very slow heart rate and still be in atrial fibrillation. Some people may have you know, a normal, what we would say heart rate somewhere between 60 and 100 beats per minute and still be in atrial fibrillation. And then there's times, especially when somebody's in the hospital, um, that we may see heart rates in atrial fibrillation at 120, 130 beats a minute. And typically, if that's the case, much more symptomatic. Um, and that you would definitely feel. But if your heart rate's normal, you may not necessarily have much as far as symptoms of the atrial fibrillation are concerned. Um, especially the longer somebody may have atrial fibrillation, um, say medicines and procedures have been tried and this isn't working out, they over time just may not necessarily feel much at all, which, you know, at that point, once it's addressed and being managed, isn't necessarily a big deal if you do or don't feel your atrial fibrillation, as long as we're, you know, addressing the risk factors going along with it. Dr. Romick, we have a couple of questions. I saw that yeah. Robert um, unmuted. Robert, you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yeah, the question I had, uh, Dr. Romick, is um, I think I've asked you this before, and I, I'm, AFib in and of itself may not be hereditary, but is it like, can it happen that basically if you have, uh, say your mother uh, had heart uh, issues, could that for whatever reason lead to uh, AFib, but not right. necessarily as a, a um, um, getting AFib just because of a, 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 a hereditary thing? Yeah, it's a great question. So there isn't, at least up until this point, um, not a defined genetic link or an actual gene that says we're going to pass this on from our parents to our offspring and so on. But as mentioned, there's a lot of conditions that predispose somebody to developing atrial fibrillation. Um, you know, part of that's just the aging process. And then part of it too is if, you know, we do definitely know that there's a, you know, genetic predisposition for coronary artery disease. Let's say, you know, your dad or your mother at a young age developed that, you know, you may be predisposed to that, which is a risk factor to developing atrial fibrillation. So although we may see it in a parent and then an offspring, it's not a genetic link, but because of maybe some other chronic or some other conditions that may have some genetic condition or predisposition, we can see that AFib goes along with that. Okay, thanks. I, yeah. I, I had a grandfather who I know had uh, heart issues mm -hmm. and he was my mother's father and my mother had heart issues. Right. Neither of them had AFib as far as I know, but mm -hmm. um, I got lucky and got AFib. There you go. <laughs> Well, like I said, you're one of the million of, millions of people out there. Yeah. So. yeah. Yep. And there was one more question, Dr. Romig. Um, if a patient um, knows that they have this, should they be careful playing like activities like tennis or sports? Right. I mean, that's another really good question as far as what does it do to your you know, lifestyle? Hopefully with good therapy and good management, it should not keep you from doing what you want to do. Um, and when I say management, that means how are we managing the rhythm itself? How are we managing your symptoms and then reducing your risk of a stroke? So if somebody either is in AFib or goes in and out of atrial fibrillation and we're addressing those issues, there's no reason why you can't go on and, you know, go play tennis, go play pickleball, you know, go for nice long bike rides. Um, obviously, we want to be cautious because most, the vast majority of the time, we have folks that are going to be on a blood thinner. Um, you know, so obviously you don't want to start picking up uh, axes and learning to juggle, you know, chainsaws or something like that by any means. But, you know, simple, you know, activities as far as your routine day to day business, no reason that you can't continue to joy and have a good quality of life, um, you know, doing what you want to do. Yeah, actually, it's actually very encouraged um, to exercise with atrial fibrillation because we know that can help reduce risk of reoccurrence.
of AFib itself. So definitely want you to be as active as you know you as you can be. Um, obviously, though, we're sometimes limited just from other, you know, maybe joint discomfort, knee issues, back issues, but no reason why you can't, you know, do what you want to do from that standpoint. All right, well, we'll keep on moving. Um, and some of it at this time, we're just going to look at how do we, what do we do initially? You know, how do we manage it? And some of that kind of comes down to the initial presentation. Obviously, if somebody is being seen by their primary care provider is for their annual follow up and it's picked up. All right, that doesn't necessarily have to be an emergent situation that we, you know, rush you to the hospital for, you know, but there are times where people can be very unstable because their heart rate may be very fast or their blood pressure may be very low. So those ones require a little bit more urgent attention. Those folks were typically seen in the emergency department just because they're feeling so unwell. And there we might want to be a little, we're typically are going to be a little bit more aggressive as far as heart rate control to get their symptoms better. Because if we can get their heart rate down, we typically can see improvement from, you know, a hemodynamic standpoint, um, blood pressure, you know, that sort of thing. Obviously, we want to be very direct as far as figuring out is, are there any reversible causes? You know, we talked about a little bit as far as lung conditions, you know, a blood clot, um, abnormal thyroid levels, you know, is there an issue um, with a bad infection that could be contributing? So always want to look at reversible causes to see if there's anything um, that we can do that might affect, you know, the underlying reason that somebody maybe went into atrial fibrillation. Sometimes other than just, you know, chronic conditions like blood pressure, age, diabetes, that may all be it, but we want to make sure we address anything that is reversible um, you know, right away. Uh, we always want to do an ultrasound of the heart. That's called an echocardiogram. I'm sure most of you are very familiar with that. Um, that allows us really good information to see heart chamber sizes, heart pumping function, you know, to see is there some type of structural issue that would be contributing to, you know, the atrial fibrillation itself. It does allow us to see maybe there's been this abnormal heart rhythm going on for a longer period of time because we can see some of those structural changes to the heart that we had discussed earlier um, and also give us some direction as potentially an underlying cause. If let's say the pressure inside the heart and lungs is very elevated, that may direct us to say, could there be an example like a blood clot in the lungs that would be you know, putting pressure onto the heart, throwing or inducing or causing atrial fibrillation, um, you know, that's definitely kind of the more urgent uh, conditions that we would look for um, in that type of scenario. If it's something that's kind of just happens to be picked up in the doctor's office or on a heart monitor, you know, maybe somebody feels palpitations, um, you know, then we can address it by utilizing some medicine in the outpatient setting. One thing that we typically always want to do is a stress test, uh, because I said, you know, there's some underlying conditions like coronary artery disease or heart artery problems that could be um, contributing to the development of atrial fibrillation. So again, a modifiable or a reversible cause that needs to be addressed. Um, also, there are some medications that we would utilize to control or suppress that irregular heart rhythm um, that we may want to steer away from in somebody with known coronary artery disease. So that can kind of help direct our therapy moving forward. And then also when we have somebody on the treadmill, if we're able to do an exercise stress test, we can see how well we have their heart rate controlled because that can lead to kind of some of those things where people wanna get out and exercise or wanna go out and do something. And we can see how well is our medicine working as far as keeping that heart rate from going too fast. Um, so an exercise stress test is very common um, along with an echocardiogram as far as testing is concerned. So don't be surprised if that's something that's done, you know, at the beginning and then periodically over the course of time. Um, and then also we want to get an idea as far as what the burden is of atrial fibrillation. Um, how often is somebody having it? How long are these episodes? Um, because it's not uncommon for people to go in and out of AFib. Sometimes people may go into AFib for a week at a time, a day at a time, a few minutes here and there. So it's highly variable. So to wear a heart monitor for anywhere from one day to a week to up to 30 days is not 
um, uncommon at all to be a standard kind of practice as far as how we're managing or getting a good idea of, of the heart rhythm itself allows us to see kind of the heart rate variability. Is it getting too low? Is it getting too fast? Where does that kind of correlate with symptoms? So wearing a heart monitor gives us a lot of valuable information as well. I know that sometimes it can be a little cumbersome having to wear that and um, kind of a bother, but it does help provide us as clinicians really good information to help better manage the atrial fibrillation. Um, and then really, you know, moving forward as far as the next steps, I kind of say there's two sides of the treatment coin for atrial fibrillation. One of them is how do we reduce that individual's risk of a stroke um, or some type of clot? And then how do we manage the rhythm? Um, they're both independent, I guess you would say, as far as how we manage them, what steps we use, what medications we use, but are both parts of successfully managing atrial fibrillation. So prevention of the embolization or specifically a stroke, and then how do we manage the heart rhythm itself? Do we worry about the heart rate? Do we utilize medicine for the rhythm? Um, and so to kind of look at that, obviously the prevention of an embolization is one of our number one priorities. Um, about 15% of all strokes in the US are caused because of atrial fibrillation. Um, the risk of a stroke increases you know, as we age, other conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary artery disease, or even having a prior stroke. Um, what we'd look at are these risk factors, and there's a specific scale that over the years has been validated to correlate with risk. Um, it's called the chads vask score, and it's an acronym based on typically um, conditions that an individual may or may not have. One would be congestive heart failure, um, hypertension, or high blood pressure. We look at somebody's age. So over the age of 75 is, an, is a higher risk than let's say if you're between the ages of 65 and 74. Below the age of 65, we would consider to be low risk and wouldn't necessarily contribute that to be a, a point on the scale. Uh, diabetes, if you've had a prior stroke or a, what we call a mini stroke or a TIA. Vascular disease, such as a prior heart attack. Um, and in this case, female gender uh, in and of itself is a point on the scale. Now you have to have at least two points or more to be considered at risk enough to be eligible or we would wanna consider uh, putting you on a specific type of blood thinner. Uh, the guidelines say if it's just zero, let's say you don't have any points, you're 64 and you've been picked up with AFib but you're otherwise healthy, then we don't necessarily have to do anything. Um, one is kind of in that gray zone where the data is kind of not super strong. And so you can do nothing. You can put maybe consider an aspirin. Some guidelines may say, or there might be some data to suggest maybe a blood thinner, but really that's just a conversation between the patient and the um, physician to decide kind of where you wanna be. But definitely when somebody's got two or more points on the scale is when we would say, the risk is high enough that it's beneficial to consider putting that person on a blood thinner. Um, obviously that's a very case by case basis. Uh, there may be some indications or reasons why we wouldn't wanna start somebody on a blood thinner, but we'd really wanna make sure that we're having those conversations to look at risk um, versus benefit and stroke risk reduction. Um, there's medications that we use and typically once somebody's diagnosed with AFib, unless there's a reason not to, we're gonna to wanna to keep you on a blood thinner long-term. Um, and maybe a reason not to would be prior bleeding issues, um, maybe very frail, elderly, frequent, frequent falls. Um, something that just may put them more at risk for bleeding um, would be something to consider. Uh, but even then that's a not necessary reason why we wouldn't wanna put somebody on a blood thinner. There are a couple of options out there. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with a drug called Coumadin or Warfarin. Um, that's been around since about the 1950s. So it's been around for quite a long time. And up until within the last decade or so, that was really the only option. That's what we had as far as a blood thinner is concerned. Um, it works pretty darn good, you know, as far as helping reduce the stroke risk. There was some downside to it where you have to keep your blood level within a certain range. So, 
there's some frequent blood draws. It's very much affected by somebody's diet and what they may or may not be consuming. Um, but fortunately, within the last decade or so, there's been several options as far as new blood thinners um, that work differently than Coumadin or Warfarin does. Um, the benefit is that there's no blood levels that you have to stay within. So we know that once you're on it, the risk of a stroke um, from atrial fibrillation is very, very low. Typically, can get you close to around 1% chance per year. Um, there's no blood draws that are necessary, so we know you're always in range. Um, and the data has shown that they are just as good, if not better, at reducing the stroke risk compared to Coumadin and um, safer as far as lower chance of bleeding, which is great. So we know that they work better. We know that they have a lower bleeding risk. So that's one thing that we always want to utilize first is one of the newer options. Um, they're still new enough that you probably see them on TV as commercials and different things. Um, there's some common ones out there, Xarelto, also called or known as Rivaroxaban. Uh, Eliquis, you'll see on TV quite a bit. That's the Pixaban. Perdaxa was one of the first to market as far as one of the new, newer, I guess you'd say, blood thinners, uh, the Bigatran. There's one that's more new, I guess, to the scene. Still not found a huge market, but um, so Vesa is an option as far as that's concerned. Um, if you want to have a conversation with me at your office visit about which one I think best, I can always talk to you about that personally. Um, but across the board, I think I would much rather prefer you on any one of our newer agents compared to Coumadin. Um, unfortunately, sometimes the downside is cost. Unfortunately, sometimes they're just not covered all that well, depending on each individual's prescription plan or provider, whatever the case may be. So if push comes to shove and we have to utilize Coumadin, it's not the end of the world but obviously it's not my first choice. So luckily we've got some other options that hopefully not too much longer we'll see um, become more available once we can, you know, cost is taken out of that equation. Um, and even better is that there are some options that don't require medication. Now at this point, they're still kind of reserved for a niche um, kind of patient. One of them is surgical resection of a certain aspect portion of the heart where we know the vast majority of clots form. So if somebody's already going undergoing open heart surgery, this is typically something that's done just kind of prophylactically. Um, so there can be a surgical resection, which still, you know, can definitely reduce somebody's risk, but doesn't necessarily mean we can stop their blood thinner altogether. There's another option called the Watchman. Uh, maybe some of you guys have heard about this, or maybe we've discussed it. Um, and this is a great option for an individual who maybe isn't the best candidate for a blood thinner long term, um, but still has a definite high risk for a stroke from atrial fibrillation. So it's a procedure that's done at the hospital. Um, it's minimally invasive where it doesn't require open heart surgery. Um, and it's essentially a little cage or umbrella that kind of seals over this one little pocket or appendage of the heart where we know about 90% of clots form with atrial fibrillation. So the data on that has been compared to Coumadin um, or the blood thinners, and it says it's, it's at least not inferior. The trials weren't designed to see if it was better, but at least we know it's just as good as being on a blood thinner, but long-term you only have to be on aspirin. So it's a great option for those nowadays that you know, definitely need to be on some type of blood thinner to help reduce their risk of a stroke but maybe have had issues with bleeding in the past while on a blood thinner or some other indication that it may be um, the risk versus benefit ratio on a blood thinner may not be in our favor for that standpoint. So there are some options um, that we can always consider if that's the case, which is great to have those um, kind of tools in our tool belt. Uh, there are a few gentlemen in the area here in Wilmington that do that. It's a very specialized procedure. Um, so we do still have that option here in Wilmington to provide that care. You don't have to go to some big center nowadays to have that done. So, so that is something that we do routinely for those individuals. Um, any questions on blood thinners or anything like that as far as you know options? I was curious, are there certain lifestyle choices too that patients should consider stopping or reducing to prevent um, this as well? As far as reducing AFib? 
or the embolization. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's sometimes not anything that they can do anything about. Um, the risk is based more just on um, some of those risk factors we had talked about. I can't change your age. I can't change, you know, the gender that we know female are just more at risk. Um, you know, obviously managing diabetes and blood pressure is great, but you know, it's one of those things that unfortunately, once we know AFib is there, the risk is gonna be there. That doesn't change. Um, necessarily, even if we are able to suppress the rhythm itself, suppress the symptoms, um, but a good healthy lifestyle is always recommended, but may not necessarily change what we're able to do with reducing the risk. The big thing to reduce the risk is managing um, that with a blood thinner or one of these other options that would be just as good. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And then we need to decide the other, you know, that I mentioned the two sides of the treatment coin. So one, we just kind of talked about the blood thinners. Now is how do we manage the heart rhythm itself? Um, typically, we want to make sure we get that heart rate slowed down because AFib that's fast, people may be more symptomatic because of that, maybe more bothersome to them. So initially, we want to utilize medicine to try to slow that heart rate down, make sure that we're keeping that within kind of our normal range, 60 to 100 maybe allowing it up to 110, but definitely want to try to keep that in a normal range as far as that's concerned, just to help provide um, minimal symptoms. You know, once we get that under control, then we can discuss, you know, do we want to go after trying to suppress the rhythm itself? Um, there's some options as far as that's concerned. Um, there's procedures called a cardioversion, um, Maybe you're familiar in the movies where they get the paddles out and they shock somebody. It's the same kind of concept, but much less dramatic. Um, it's nothing like that. But we do utilize electric current to kind of reset the heart rhythm itself. That's a procedure done at the hospital. We do that again routinely and has pretty good success to restore or get somebody back into a regular heart rhythm. Now we may want to use medicine as well Maybe if that's the route we're gonna to go to try to improve or increase our chances of suppressing or getting somebody back into a regular heart rhythm. And so there's some anti-arrhythmics. Um, I kind of describe a kind of a stepwise pattern to what we may do for rhythm control. You know, the first step is just getting the rate under control. There's very minimal risk as far as that's concerned. Um, the next kind of treatment step up is an anti-arrhythmic medication. Um, why that's not necessarily always first line is because we have to be cautious with these medications, um, especially if we're monitoring somebody's kidney function, if that's abnormal, uh, liver disease because of how these medications may or may not be metabolized in the body. And at times there's a very low, small percent chance, but they actually may induce abnormal heart rhythms themselves. So some of the medications we actually have to put people into the hospital for as we get those initiated for a couple of days. That's pretty standard of practice. Once those are initiated, the risk is very low. As long as we have the appropriate medication and the appropriate patient, antirhythmic medications do just a great job as far as you know suppressing um, the arrhythmia itself. If we still have difficult to can control or manage atrial fibrillation, there are procedures um, where we actually go inside the heart themselves and kind of map out the electrical pathways um, and are able to essentially kind of prevent AFib from, you know, getting started in the first place. Um, that's called an ablation. That's what I would consider to be kind of the final tier um, if we've kind of failed some of those other steps along the way. Um, but yeah, there's different options as far as medications are concerned. And even if we did end up going to something like an ablation, that procedure itself is still uh, very common done on a daily basis. Uh, the safety of that is well validated and is something that we routinely would refer folks off to if we get to that point as far as symptoms are concerned. So again, a lot of options as far as how we're gonna control the rhythm itself, whether we're just gonna kind of keep it under control or get after it a little bit more with different medications like antiarrhythmics or even going for procedures like a cardioversion or an ablation. Um, we may not always 
tell people, yeah, we need to start medications to try to keep you in rhythm or we need to do a cardioversion. We try to though, right? We want to try to at least restore somebody into their natural normal heart rhythm. We know that hemodynamically, that's when the heart functions best. So it makes sense to try to get somebody back into rhythm. Um, and so we always want to at least attempt a cardioversion if we can, especially if it's first diagnosed, try to do that. Um, if we can, we can utilize medicines to suppress that rhythm and get for a, you know, an ablation. So it may be a lot initially, especially if you're first diagnosed that we're maybe making changes or suggestions to management, but that's all because we want to try to, you know, keep you in a regular heart rhythm because we know that's when you're going to work the best. Um, you know, symptom improvement is going to be better if we're suppressing atrial fibrillation. The younger folks, you know, maybe in their 30s, 40s, 50s, we want to try to keep them in rhythm just because if somebody's in AFib for, let's say, 40 years, you know, that there's definitely going to be more remodeling and can lead to other conditions like heart failure and things like that. So we definitely want to try to be very intentional and proactive, especially when initially diagnosed or if you're on the younger side, that we're going to try to get you back in rhythm so that we can try to prevent some maybe long-term complications if left kind of unaddressed for a period of time. So don't be surprised if, you know, your cardiologist or your physician is saying, all right, that didn't work. Let's try this. Let's try this. Maybe now we consider a different medication or maybe we try a cardioversion again, or maybe we talk to a specialist about an ablation. And that's all in, with the intention of trying to keep you feeling as good as you can for as long as you can. Um, so yeah, new onset atrial fibrillation, although you know somebody may not necessarily feel it, if we get them back in rhythm, maybe they realize, you know, maybe I wasn't feeling as good as I thought I was. Maybe I did get more fatigued or, you know, with less exertion, or, you know, maybe I just didn't realize that I wasn't at my peak. And so if we can keep somebody in a regular heart rhythm, you know, they might feel even a little bit better um, and improve their quality of life. Um, as far as prevention, there are some things, you know, we had mentioned a little bit earlier, what are some things that we can try to prevent this uh, reoccurrence once somebody's had AFib? There's an analysis done not too long ago when they looked at diet. And the one that really kind of shown the best as far as suppressing or preventing recurrent is if we kind of tend towards following more of that Mediterranean style of diet. Um, if you're at all tech savvy or go to the library, Barnes and Noble, and you just Google Mediterranean diet, you're gonna have a thousand options as far as that's concerned. Um, um, that would be a great option to consider. We saw that the you know, extra virgin olive oil lowered the risk of development of AFib compared to uh, you know, people that just kind of followed a regular Western style of diet. Physical activity, meaning you're physically and aerobically active and weight loss can reduce the recurrence and overall burden of atrial fibrillation. So we don't want this to be something that affects your lifestyle where you don't feel like you should exercise. We encourage that. We want you to be active out there. We want you to enjoy you know, different types of activities. There's no reason why you can't participate um, in a good walking routine, um, tennis, pickleball, you know, biking, whatever the case may be that you enjoy. We encourage that. Um, and then one thing we would ask, maybe we suppress or maybe cut back um, on the alcohol consumption. Uh, we know that those with less alcohol um, appear to have a decreased risk of atrial fibrillation compared to somebody that maybe is um, drinking more than I would say at least two drinks a day um, or several at once um, can definitely lead to kind of recurrence or an increased burden of atrial fibrillation you know, over time. So a few things that you can do yourself that may help kind of recur or reduce the recurrence of that atrial fibrillation. Um, when we look at that, if we have somebody on a heart monitor, um, but we know that they have AFib, maybe they go in and out of it, 90% of people are going to have recurrent episodes of atrial fibrillation. So I may ask you, do you feel your atrial fibrillation since the last time we were in? How often do you experience it? What do you sense? And sometimes, not uncommon, the answer is I don't really feel anything, but I know that if we monitored you for weeks or months at a time, we would have recurrent episodes of atrial fibrillation. Um, we see this pretty frequently in our folks now that have pacemakers. Um, we're getting tons of data over the years with pacemakers. 
And part of that is we're able to pick up atrial fibrillation. So it's not uncommon that a day or a week doesn't go by that somebody's had a pacemaker in for six months and we're picking up a decent percentage or burden of AFib, even in patients that don't feel it um, whatsoever. Um, so it's not uncommon that you don't feel it, but don't be fooled because you probably are still having episodes of atrial fibrillation. Um, and it can actually go um, the other way. Um, there's folks that have said, you know what, I definitely feel it. I know exactly when I have my AFib. So, you know, I know when I'm having it, I haven't had it. And they may say, I feel it. And we watch them and it's not uncommon. It's about 40% of the time, there's no AFib. So it is, it can be quite challenging for folks to really get a good handle on the symptoms that go along with AFib because sometimes we can feel it and it's not actually there. And then there's times where people don't feel it and they are having AFib. So that's one of those things that I'm always gonna be on about um, being on the blood thinner because of that reason it, you know, alone is that once you're diagnosed with it, even though you may not feel it, there's a really good chance that you're still having episodes of atrial fibrillation. And some of that is still, despite the best medicine that we have and the best treatment, you're still gonna have it. Um, so that's why just because you have an ablation doesn't mean we necessarily stop your blood thinner. Um, so, so in summary, remember atrial fibrillation is very common. Um, don't be disappointed, you know, that you were diagnosed with AFib. I think, you know, the vast majority of us are going to develop it at some point um, in our lives. It does have an increased risk of a stroke. And so that's why we are always um, intentional about a blood thinner so that we can help reduce that risk of a stroke. The symptoms can be very variable person to person, sometimes simple things like palpitations or maybe feeling short of breath, some more vague symptoms of just feeling fatigued and more worn out. Um, and then how we manage it is definitely dependent on the urgency of how they present or how you may be feeling at the time. So whether or not we need to do something right away or we've got time to work through this in the outpatient setting. Um, so the two sides of the treatment coin that both are interconnected with atrial fibrillation how do we manage the rhythm itself, you know, with medications to deal with the heart rate or medications to deal with the rhythm and try to suppress that atrial fibrillation? Those are conversations that are made individual um, case by case, kind of how we're going to do that based on that individual person. Um, and then obviously the other side that's interconnected but separate would be how are we going to help reduce their risk of a stroke? Um, the vast majority of the time that's done with a blood thinner. There are some options as far as that's concerned, but those that maybe aren't the best candidates or have a reason not to be on a blood thinner, we do have some other options as well to keep their stroke risk down um, and still keep their bleeding risk down. So with that, I open it up to any questions that folks may have or any other things you want to address with, the, uh, with atrial fibrillation. Uh, Dr. Roman, uh, I have another question. I, ha um, I have one of those implantable uh, loop recorders in, uh, in my chest, which is a whole lot better than carrying around something that is, you know, strapped around your chest or whatever, because I right. hardly ever know that it's there. Mm -hmm. um, but it was installed in uh, December of 2019. So I don't know how much longer that's got. And what, ha what should I be doing after it, the battery's yeah. no good and no Right, so that's a great, those are great tools to have, especially in somebody that, you know, we're addressing medications or maybe the symptoms are vague or um, maybe somebody that had some AFib, but during an acute illness, we don't know if there's recurrent episodes. Um, so I love having that option because like you said, we get day-to-day -day data on your atrial fibrillation, but not something that you have to wear. Once it's there, you kind of like set it and forget it. Yeah, I um, highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, most of them, the newer ones, um, man, I remember when I was in my training, if you think of what a thumb drive looked like, you know, we were installing those in folks and those were, they were great, but they weren't the smallest. Um, now they're just injectable. Um, I would say on average, depending on the make and the model, they last three to four years, um, uh, which is a great amount of time. When the batteries do run dry, there's a couple options. One, we just leave it. If the battery is done, we don't have to do anything about it. It can just sit there. It's not gonna cause any trouble to you. 
obviously we won't get any more information off of it, but it can it can stay there. If we want to, we can always take that one out and put in a new one and then have more you know, long-term monitoring. Some of that is gonna be, what are we gonna do with that data? Is it gonna change how we manage you moving forward? So we don't always take it out and put in another one to have three or four more years worth of information if it's not necessarily gonna change our treatment strategy. Um, some people choose, you know what, I don't want it in me, just take it out when it's done. So it kind of just depends on what we put it in or what was the kind of the scenario that it was put in for in the first place. And then two, taking into consideration, what are we going to do with long or you know more data, another three, another four years worth of information? Is that going to change you know, what we do? And that would potentially decide if we want to put in another one you know, moving forward when that battery does you know, run dry. Cross the bridge when we get to it. Right, right. Um, I'm not a speaker for anybody in particular. I have no conflict of interest, but um, there is another device that's FDA approved that you can actually purchase off of Amazon. Um, it's called the Cardia Mobile, spelled with a K. And what that does is it uh, syncs up with your smartphone um, and you just kind of put your fingers on this little tab that it comes with and it will take, it'll make like a little EKG. Um, so you can see what your heart rhythm is doing. Um, it actually has been validated by the FDA. So it, if it says you have atrial fibrillation, it's a good chance that you do. It may come back and determine it, and that's something to talk about with your provider, or it may say it's normal. Um, that's not continuous, but that's only when you, you know, put your fingers on it and check it for those couple of seconds. Uh, but that's something you can simply do at home. It's relatively inexpensive. Um, I have several patients that use that, will send me information, you know, email it to me, or they bring it to their office visit and say, we will look at this, they can pull it up on their smartphone um, and say, what do you think, is this AFib or not? And it can help definitely kind of help us with some management and as far as, you know, symptoms are concerned. So again, that's something that you can consider. You don't have to have a prescription or anything like that. It's not something that I say, you know, do it because I'm getting a kickback by any means, uh, but it is something that's available at home for you to use. That actually, Dr. Romick, um, opens up a question that we got in the chat. Um, so the cardio mobile you mentioned, that's probably more preferred than actually checking for AFib with a smartwatch. Like a smartwatch, is that something you would not yeah, trust? Yeah, so the smartwatches are, I think that's improving with time. So far, there's only been one that's been validated with the FDA, and that was the Apple Watch. Um, one of my colleagues here at the office, he and I have been involved in a clinical trial with Wilmington Health and Samsung and their watch. That data has not been released yet. Um, so wearable technology is definitely going to become a wave of the future. Um, but right now, there's not been too much. It's been definitely like validated saying for sure if you have the Garmin watch or a Fitbit or, you know, you know, whatever it is, they, those may or may not have quite the same robust data behind them, um, like the Apple watch has had validated and the other Cardia mobile. Um, there are some good options because if the watch, whatever the brand may be, says, you know, you might have something, talk to your provider, then we can utilize something that's more, you know, wearable, like a heart monitor that we can actually see ourselves that would help validate one way or the other. So the technology is coming. I think it's going to change in just the next couple of years. Um, but I still think at this point, we don't rely completely just on everybody's watch um, because we still have to have some, you know, hard data right in front of us. But it is a great option. So many of these watches and things like that are becoming more available for individuals. Thank you, Dr. Romick. Were there any other questions that anyone had this evening? Well, on behalf of Dr. Romick, as well as Wilmington Health Cardiology, we appreciate you all today for joining and engaging in questions. And we thank you as well for um, joining in this to actually allow some education for other patients in the future that this may be helpful for. So thank you again. Have a good evening.